Ricardo is the number two driver in the Williams team, but the team of this standard is in effect a, a two driver, two number one driver team. But again, Mansell has got this situation where he's got the spare car available to him throughout the season. So if Petresi, for example, were not to be able to finish the session in his car, he may well have to wait it out. Petresi coming across the line now. Well, 124.726, good effort. Petresi in third spot, second row of the grid, ahead of Mansell, ahead of him by over half a second. So, temporarily at least, the order Senna, Prost, Petresi, Alessi, Moreno, and then Nigel Mansell, PK, Modena, and Berger following up the line, and Emanuele Pirro in 10th place. And here's a man now who was in pole position here last year, Gerhard Berger, in his first race for McLaren, got the pole, didn't have a very good race, spun in the race, clipped the, uh, the tyre wall, but got back into the pits, continued, but uh, 1990 was a very, very testing year for Gerhard Berg. It was a year, I think, of reflection, and a year where he had to look at himself, analyse himself, and decide, well, I thought I was a Grand Prix driver, but when you join McLaren, and you have Ayrton Senna as your teammate, it's an altogether, altogether different game. That must be the most difficult job in the world, being teammate to the world champion, because there, there can be no room for excuses, can there? Well, there's nobody more committed to his craft, let's call it that, than Ayrton Senna. The man is truly remarkable, and anybody who is a teammate of his is confronted with a force which is, well, just unequal currently in Formula One. Even Alan Prost, after two years of it, gave up and went to Ferrari. Well, Nakajima waving Gerhard Berger past there. The different. Gerhard, you can just notice in the... You've got a shot of the cockpit. You see how he really... Oh, Gerhard, you just... I was about to say, oh, little nudge, left rear. Well, we're watching him coming around that slow left-hand corner. I was about to say, you can see the difference between him and Senna. He's actually visually trying harder. And of course, he went and lost the car right in front of us. And that's what he did all last year. He was, in my opinion, overdriving too much. He was very uncomfortable in the car, physically uncomfortable. And he tried to compensate, I think, by trying too hard. There we saw graphically a case of Gerhard Berger trying too hard. Well, now things beginning to hot up again as we go towards the closing quarter of this first qualifying session. Nigel Mansell is back out on the circuit. 125.277 was what he recorded in his last outing. Well, just listen to Mansell. He's re this lap is certainly going to be an improvement on that one at 125.277. Just looking at it, you can see he is going quicker. He may have gone back into the pits after his first run, made some small changes to the car, but quick laps are always clean laps, and Mansell's lap so far is, is I reckon, as clean as you're going to see. Well, Mansell making tidy work of... Well, he lost a gear there. He managed to lose a gear. Look, the car went... He's lost. Something's happened. Either he's lost a gear or the drive. Whatever it is, something's happened to the gearbox in Mansell's, for, in Mansell's Williams. He's revving the, I was going to say, something off his engine. Great shame, something in the gearbox is broken. That may be a drive shaft, in fact, because the car was wandering around as he came through that corner. Just a few minutes of this session left. It's still Ayrton Senna, and Senna remaining, I think, firmly in the McLaren pits for these final few moments, as is Gerhard Berger. So Senna from Prost and Petrese and therefore Petrese, one of the few people who could change the order on this provisional day. And there's a surprise for all of us. Having said that, we thought Ayrton Senna would stay there. He's done exactly what we were talking about a little while ago. And in the last gasp, the final few moments, Ayrton Senna comes out onto the track. And now we will see whether Ayrton Senna can find enough room, enough air in front of him to unleash one of those really uncanny qualifying laps of his. Well, they've got exactly 90 seconds in which to find out because that is all that is left of the session. He's got Mauricio Guzman just ahead of him. But Senna, he all he has to do is get across that start-finish line before the flag falls. That's going to be a close call because he isn't actually running at racing speed. So 
he's going to have to measure it very very cautiously indeed Capelli ahead of him and he's looking fairly busy out there as well we said that Senna likes to pick his moment when there are as few cars out there and they're as nicely spaced as possible there's a whole bunch there whether he's relying on those people going in as he comes past the start finish line on the beginning of his flying lap there's a brief glimpse of John Alesi there in his Ferrari. We've got in the box, we've got Ricardo Patrese. And there we have in the full screenshot, Ricardo Patrese. A little wriggle as he came out of that. Second gear happened bend at the far end of the circuit. Patrese is certainly trying very hard indeed to put himself onto the front row alongside Ayrton Senna. Get that Ferrari back onto the second row of the grid. Well then, high drama at the end of what has been a very relaxed qualifying session so far. Yes, now we're looking at this in this box. We saw Senna, he's now got himself ahead of Capelli. The road is relatively clear ahead of him. And he's now coming around the final corner onto the start-finish line. Let's have a look and see how many seconds has he got. Well, he's just about got a minute of this session left, so he will be able to go and complete this lap. But he's not going very quickly. He's what has Ayrton decided to do? Has he got a problem or has he decided to abort the lap? He has something has gone wrong mechanically or he's just said, oh, sod it. There's no point. I've done the lap anyway. Well, they said, that he can't possibly get back to the start. Now, that was the flag. That's what it is. We couldn't see it. The checkered flag has been waved. and it did not make it round in time. It's lose 90 seconds. First qualifying session. Just two. He's hot off the press. The list of times from the crowd qualifying session. John Alesi, the quick man, 123.519 seconds, just easing in front of Ayrton Senna's 123.53. Third quickest, Alan Prost, 124.507. Fourth fastest, Ricardo Patrese, 124.726. And then it's Emmanuel Epiro, an excellent effort. Fifth fastest, 124.876. Nelson Piquet, sixth fastest. 125.02 and Stefano Modena right behind him 25.06. Roberto Moreno also quick in eighth place 125.17. Then Nigel Mansell 125.27. 125.815. That's Pierre Luigi Martini and Berger 125.914 into the 126s and it's Satoru Nakajima 126.058 followed by JJ Leto 126.765 Maurizio Gujulmin 126.865 is 14th fastest 15th fastest Aguri Suzuki 126.987 16th quickest man today 127.164 seconds is top queenie and then Martin Brundle 17th fastest 127.1 84. Eric Bernard, 127.446, is 18th fastest. And Bertrand Gachot for Jordan is 19th fastest, 127.568. Gianni Morbidelli, 127.625. And then Nicola Larini for Lamborghini, 21st fastest, 127.761. 24 is 23rd. 24 fastest Eric Bowman, 128.904. And Michele Alvaretto, 25th, 128.067. Alex Caffey, 26, just making the cut, 129.308. Sven Ivan Capelli, a very unhappy Ivan Capelli, 154.8. Welcome back to Phoenix, Arizona for the second day of the first race of the 1991 Formula One Grand Prix season. As you can see, another beautiful sunny day here in the Valley of the Sun. Yesterday's qualifying session, well, interesting in the extreme. Started slowly and then developed in a big way towards the end of it. John, I thought the last seven minutes were the best. Well, Richard, I wouldn't like to be in those last seven and a half minutes. So many cars trying to get onto the track to get that second set of tyres, take advantage of it. One man succeeded, John Alesi, did a fantastic job. Ayrton Senna tried to do it, but he missed getting a clear lap by about four seconds. He came around four seconds too late, 
didn't get a run in the second set of tires. We have to wait now until this one-hour session Saturday afternoon to see can Ayrton Senna get onto the pole position or to going to be a Ferrari and that's coveted and very, very valuable. Remember, pole position on a street track is very, very important. Off the line, and that means the guy in second place is going to be on the dirty part of the street. The man on pole position is going to have the clean part of the street and by being there, you're going to get into the first corner first. So, crucial one hour this afternoon. Well, an interesting hour coming up this afternoon. Yesterday as well was fairly interesting. Let's take a look now at the news from the pits following that session. Mixed emotions indeed for the Jordan team. Andrea De Cesaris failed to make the cut in pre-qualifying, but the young Bertrand Gachot was the man who got through. I caught up with Eddie Jordan after that pre-qualifying session to get his reactions to the results. A year ago, perhaps a lot of people would have said, Jordan Grand Prix, no way. It's the first race of the season. You're in it, you're here. I'm semi-depleted, if you like. I'm 50% here. I mean, it is a big uh, shame that we haven't got both cars in the race, but then uh, maybe I'm too um, pushy. My, my demands are very high. I think it's always been part of my makeup. I'm not saying it's a, a, an asset or a failure. It just, for me, is one of the, the makeups. I set very high standards for myself and for the team and the people involved in it. And sometimes they don't quite measure up or whatever there are. Uh, times that they don't actually measure up to those beliefs, but this perhaps is one of them. But I, I can't say I'm totally disappointed. It's just that maybe I, I thought that we would uh, be able to come very strong at the very beginning. And of course, I think we've got plenty of time and I think the weekend's not over yet. So who's to know? But the story of this qualifying session came from Ferrari and it came in the shape once again of Jean Alesi snatching provisional pole position in quite literally the dying seconds of this qualifying session. In the paddock afterwards, Alesi obviously well pleased to be back at Phoenix. You like this circuit, don't you? Yes, I like this circuit, but also, you know, I, I changed a little bit the, the setup of the car because the beginning was... Uh, uh, not uh, good for, for me. Alacy well pleased, but Gerhard Berger and McLaren less happy. This spin put pay to Gerhard Berger's hopes of qualifying well in this first session. Why with one car was 11 and why the other one was second? We should have been one too. I think towards the end of the, towards the, end of the session, the, the circle was very, very quick. And unfortunately, Gerhard put, touched the wall and lost a lot of time and um, Ayrton didn't have enough time. When he got out, he just got the flag. He didn't do a complete lap. Alain Prost was third quickest, but he was a second off the provisional pole time. However, Jean Alacy has indicated that the Ferrari 642 is obviously capable of a lot more. After the session ended, we asked Alain Prost for his reactions. First session, so the cars are getting better all the time, also the track is proving all the time because it was very dirty when we started this morning. More than uh, anything, I mean, I was quite happy with the car, but uh, after the Nakajima accident, we started in all together and there was only uh, seven minutes left and uh, I had traffic and uh, I think uh, even had to out traffic the second set of tires and uh, difficult, to, difficult to tell. Jean had a very good uh, clear lap and uh, it shows uh, that the Ferrari was uh, also very fast on uh, this kind of track, which is normally not uh, our favorite uh, place, but uh, I'm also very impressed about uh, the McLaren today and the Honda engine. At Williams, Nigel Mansell had a lucky escape when this drive shaft failure on a hot lap almost put him in the wall. He'd already banged it once in the morning session, nearly did it again here. However, despite the fact that that spoiled his qualifying attempt, he seemed fairly philosophical about the whole thing when we spoke to him afterwards. Nigel, that qualifying session, one minute we were looking at what looked as if it was going to be a very quick lap, and then we were looking at what looked like a broken drive shaft. Uh, did you get it on the film? It was a big moment, wasn't it? I mean, I went into the corner and really put the power down, and something snapped at the back and almost threw me off the circuit, and it was, in fact, a drive shaft snapped halfway in the corner. And I think um, on the equipment, uh, it would have been a low 24, which I think would have put us second place or definitely third place anyway. So, but anyway, we've, uh, we've got tomorrow to look forward to. The main thing was we kept it out of the wall because at one time I thought, oh no, we're going to hit the wall now. Because uh, it was exciting for about two or three seconds. 
despite having to pre-qualify, Emanuele Pirro was fifth fastest in the first qualifying session. He and teammate JJ Leto have the use of the new Judd V10, which looks like being a useful package on the streets of Phoenix. Julian Bailey's deputising for the still recovering Martin Donnelly at Lotus and had what looked like a very exciting moment. A cracked oil pipe caused this fire, but it does appear to be more dramatic than it actually was. Teammate Mika Hakkinen had a spin, also had a bit of a disappointing first session. to Phoenix, Arizona. This, as you can see, is the Valley of the Sun, and this is the very beginning of the 1991 Formula One World Championship. It's here, in just a few hours, that the first round of this series will be contested. An open and competitive season, plenty of excitement already in the pits, plenty of action. John, it's going to be one hell of a season. Yes, Richard, I think we're going to see a really tremendous season, 1991. The first thing you're going to notice on your TV sets is noise, there's going to be a lot of noise because now we've really got only two teams with competitive V8 engines, that's Benetton and Jordan. Everybody else has moved on to V10 or V12 engines and they are loud. And of course in the streets of Phoenix, noise is bouncing up all the buildings around us. So I feel we've got a, an opportunity to see motor racing, real motor racing because everybody's getting closer and closer together. The top four teams are going to be fighting out every round of the Grand Prix season. This is Phoenix, capital of the state of Arizona and eighth largest city in the United States. Founded in 1860 on the banks of the Salt River, the city stands in cowboy country, home of the Grand Canyon, the Painted Desert and the Navajo Indian. Now, Phoenix, with 280 days of sunshine every year, boasts 191 golf courses, a full complement of country clubs and international hotel chains, its own massive and busy airport and, of course, its own Grand Prix. Well, that's Phoenix, Arizona. Now, let's move on and have a look at some of the major competitors during the course of the upcoming season. Most people agree that there is a top four, and these are they. McLaren took the 1990 title, but came under considerable pressure as the season progressed, and they arrive in Phoenix with a new multi-valve Honda V12, the unit Honda publicly promised Ayrton Senna in Paris last year. And this is the man who hopes that that engine can help him achieve another world title. His teammate Gerhard Berger more comfortable this season in a larger cockpit. But of the two, it is of course the enigmatic genius of Ayrton Senna which captures most attention. And this year Senna knows his talents are challenged from all sides. I think it's going to be even more competitive this year because the technical level of different teams are higher than in the past and therefore to win the races and to succeed in the championship is going to take even more communication, more commitment, more desire to do it. A lot of people in this paddock this weekend have got their fingers crossed that they've got it all right. Are you trusting to luck or are you feeling more confident? No, I think uh, consistently you do well if you're doing it right, not by lucky. But, uh, but really technically and I the equipment is right and also your approach is right and uh, we just about starting on season starting a street circuit which is very particular and many unexpected things can happen but uh, the experience that we have got from the past few years can only count positively to do better than in, than in the past and that's what I hope to be able to do Ferrari probably share top billing with McLaren in the form book. The 641 was very competitive. The new 642 should be even more so. Alain Prost seems to be very much more at ease with himself despite the upsets last season. To partner him, team manager Cesare Fiorio signed the brilliant young Frenchman Jean Alesi who grabbed everyone's attention here in Phoenix last year with a brilliant drive. John, first race of the season, just a couple of days away, all the preparation and everything finished. How do you think you're ready? Um, you know, I think we work uh, very, very hard all the winter. We have a very uh, competitive car, now we have to race and to see uh, what uh, will happen. What do you think of the circuit here in Phoenix? You know, it's a typical circuit. Very uh, difficult to, uh, to see the line because uh, with the world it's, uh, it's not easy, but uh, 
it's uh, an interesting uh, race. You know, I asked you that because you had quite a good race here last year, didn't you? Yes, it's true. You know, when when you you have some uh, good results on the circuit, you like that. Think you're going to do the same thing again this year? Uh, I would like, but uh, you know, it's, it's not easy in uh, motor m motor uh, uh, racing. It's uh, it's very uh, difficult to have uh, exactly the, the same thing all the time. Another of the leading contenders are the Cannon Williams team powered again by Renault and certainly with enough power and perhaps too with a resurgence of confidence after all the yes I will no I won't of last year Nigel Mansell finally succumbed to the persuasion of Frank Williams and starts 91 back home at Cannon Williams his teammate the experienced Ricardo Patrese very much the number two driver in the team Along with McLaren, Ferrari and Williams, the other major contender must be Benetton. They finished 1990 with a late season charge and the V8 Ford, which suddenly seemed to grow wings, has, so they say, been given more power for 1991. And here's a man who found a new lease of life at the end of last year and starts 91 with a lot of people expecting a lot from him, Nelson Piquet. And joining Nelson to replace the injured Sandro Nanini is Roberto Moreno, the Brazilian driver expected to go well in Formula One and who almost certainly will in the Benetton Ford. Those are the major contenders for honours during the course of 1991 and all during this year we'll be running a series of Formula One competitions here on Eurosport. Let's have a look now at the very first of them. Lap one of Eurosport's fabulous Formula One competition. These must be won. Five Canon EOS 1000F cameras and ten rally jackets from Champion Spark Plugs. What seller's first name and what nationality is he? Answers to Eurosport F1 competition, PO Box 46, TW4 6NF UK by April the 21st. The winners will be announced during the San Marino Grand Prix when we enter lap two of the competition. So, once we've picked the first lucky winners, we'll be asking you the second question and giving away more great prizes from Canon cameras and from Champion Spark Plugs. Now, back to the race. 8 o'clock in the morning at Phoenix, the first round of pre-qualifying for 1991. Five teams, eight drivers, what will happen next? Among those teams, the newest of the new, Team 7 Up Jordan. And we caught up with team manager under intense pressure, Eddie Jordan, to find out whether his dreams are about to come true. Uh, I suppose it's becoming a little bit more nervous, uh, not because uh, I'm worried about anything in, in uh, particular, it's just that it's taken such a long time to actually get to the reality of being here. Is it more difficult than Formula 3000? I'll tell you after pre-qualifying tomorrow, but uh, of course it is. There are 15, 16 world-class teams here, they're the best in the world. They've got all very good budgets, they have got excellent drivers, they know exactly what they're doing. Technology in terms of the design, all excellent. I have to believe that our own is particularly good as well. So from that point of view, I feel that on the team side that we're in very good shape. Most people tend to agree with that opinion of Eddie Jordan's. The buzz in the pits is that these two cars are expected to do well. It's anticipated that in six months' time, halfway through the season, they'll have escaped the pre-qualifying lottery. But for now, that's what they must go through. And the experienced Andrea De Cesare is perhaps the man expected to hold pre-qualifying together for Jordan. But straight away, it was the two Scuderia Italia Dolaras of Pirro and Leto which set the pace. Only four cars can go through, and these two drivers and the team, of course, experienced at this game, so perhaps it's no surprise to see them set the running. Time started off in the mid-40s on a very dusty track, but these two cars, with plenty of back-end grip, soon brought the times down through the 30s and started heading down towards the high 20s. Early in the one-hour qualifying session, it looked as if Olivier Griard may have made it through, but this spin was just one of many upsets which prevented him from making the cut. He finished up seventh fastest out of eight runners in this morning's session. Eric van der Poel was also expected to do well, but he made only a couple of laps, and at 1 minute 37.04, he was the slowest of the pre-qualifying bunch and hardly appeared on the track at all. Pedro Chavez did very well earlier on. He set the pace right in the beginning, 
and he was going very hard on a track which was clearly slippery and which clearly didn't offer him a lot of back end grip and this was the result. Chavez, sixth fastest, one minute 31.1. Then it was three quarters of the way through the session that Emmanuel E. Pirro unleashed his fast time. One minute, 28.28 seconds. The fastest man in the pre-qualifying session and definitely through to the main qualifying session later in the day. Teammate JJ Leto was flying as well, 128.79 seconds, just fractions behind Emmanuel E. Pirro, and these two definitely look as if they will be out of pre-qualifying before too long. Another of the new teams, Lamborghini, and it was Nicola Larini who suddenly stormed it just before the session closed. A fine effort from him with a car that had virtually no back-end grip at all on this very dusty surface, a minute 30.24 to be third quickest. Then came disappointment for Andrea De Cesaris. The engine on the 7-up Jordan let him down just before the session ended, and just seconds later, he was bumped from the number four spot by teammate Bertrand Gacho, who ran 1 minute 30.304 just to scrape in. So the first hurdle of pre-qualifying over and done with, or at least it is for some people. Four drivers go through. Emmanuel Ipiro and JJ Leto, the two Dallara teammates, first and second. 1 minute 28.28 and 1 minute 28.792. Nicola Larini, third quickest for Lamborghini, a minute 30.244. And Bertrand Gacho in fourth place, just making the cut, a minute 30.304. Just the wrong side of the line, Andrea de Cesaris, a minute 30.97. Then Pedro Chavez, one minute 31.11. Olivier Criard, a minute 32.22. And at the bottom of that list, a disappointing eighth place for Eric van der Poel, one minute 37.04. So those are the four who go through to qualifying proper and that session, as you can see, is about to get underway. Join us again in a couple of minutes after the break. Coverage of the 1991 Formula One Grand Prix season, the first full qualifying session of which is about to get underway. But really, this is the man all eyes are going to be on. He's virtually completed his first out lap. He's coming up to this funny shaped left hand corner onto the pit straight. Now, pedal to the middle, a center start. His first timed lap of this afternoon, Friday afternoon's time session. And in the past, we've seen him on these blistering laps. He's really, he just masters the art of being able to harness the energy of his engine, his car, the qualifying tires in such a way. It doesn't look spectacular, but is it quick? I tell you, it's spectacular. Senna, of course, is a very precise driver, and that's one of the things which are vitally important on a circuit like this. You can see for yourself that the huge concrete slabs which line the streets of Phoenix and form this new shaped track are totally unforgiving and you can see there that Ayrton Senna are already just twitching the back end. Yes, he's, uh, this thing with, here we are in car with Senna now, this is a new part of the circuit. This is one of the quicker parts, in fact it's the quickest corner on the circuit. Getting very, very close indeed on the outside, there's a tower wall there which actually protrudes onto the track. Now down into third gear for this right hand corner. And look, look at the amount of effort, he's, he's really very little effort indeed that he's putting into driving. No fireworks, nothing spectacular, just maximizing the capacity of the car, the tires, the engine. And there he is now at the final corner. It's going to be in about three seconds time coming across the start finish line. What's Senna done? Well, teammate Gerhard Berger is also on the track. Nelson Piquet's quickest, but I think that deposes him fairly conclusively. Ayrton Senna, 123.53, just a whisker slower than this morning's 123.52. That is precision at work, is it not? Yes, it is, and that's a very, very good, let me call it, opening shot, because Senna's come out, he's gone and done his one warm-up lap, he then got on with the programme. It wasn't the, the most ideal lap for him. There's a couple of places where the car was fidgeting, the back was stepping out, but it's still good enough to give him provisional pull. Nigel Mansell has just done a 1 minute 25.277. That puts him in third spot. Alan Prost currently in second place with a 1 minute 
But that man, Ertensen, has one second clear advantage over Alan Prost. But of course, these are the two guys that are going to be battling, not just last year, but I expect equally hard throughout the 91 season. I think it's fair to say that Ayrton Senna at this moment is sitting in his car, looking at the monitor balanced across the top of it and just waiting for his moment. But it looks as if he may have quite a long time to wait. We saw that 124 from Alain Prost and then nothing from him. Alacy has only recently come out to join him and also 124, so the two Ferraris quite slow. Gerhard Berger, interestingly, he's eighth fastest at the moment, 125.91. So he's a long way slower than Ayrton Senna. And Ricardo Patrese. You see the sparks from the back of his car. Now we're looking at more Bedelli in the Ferrari, V12 Ferrari engine, Minardi. But this is Patrese really having his first serious qualifying attempt. For Tyrrell too, that first session, not quite as good as it might have been, especially after the promise of last season, which began so well here in Phoenix. Stefano Modena and teammate Satoru Nakajima have the use of last year's Honda V10 engine, a well-proven power package. They're also using Pirelli tyres, and they too could prove to be significant on the streets of Phoenix. At Leighton House, we're looking at the same driver lineup as last year. Maurizio Guzelman is partnered by Ivan Capelli. Those two are sitting in front of a brand new engine, though. It's the new Ilmore V10. The first qualifying session, not as good for them as it could have been. They have another hour in which to improve, and they'll be looking to do so. Martin Brundle returns to Brabham this year after a year away from Formula One. We caught up with him after yesterday's qualifying session and asked him what it's like to be back. It's changed a lot, obviously. It's changed ownership. Got a new uh, contract with a major engine supplier, Yamaha, with a new 60-valve V12. And, um, yeah, very happy to be back. I never really wanted to leave, but uh, circumstances dictated that. I think I made the right decision, but I'm happy to be back in Formula 1. I was going to ask you, actually, what made you come back to Brabham, but that really answers it, if you didn't really want to leave them. No, it's, uh, I mean... For me to work well in the team, I need to really enjoy the team, be part of the team, and I can do that at uh, TWR Jaguar, and I can do it at Brabham also. And um, I, f I left at the end of 89, early 90, when I felt I'd had a good season at Brabham, and um, I, I sort of left feeling a lot of unfinished work, you know? And uh, I'm pleased to come back, and hopefully we can put all that right. Brundle's teammate is Mark Blundell, new to Formula One, and we asked him for his thoughts on this Phoenix circuit. Uh, it's an all-new circuit for me anyway, but uh, looking at the circuit, it looks a little bit different from the map of last year. It looks OK for a street circuit, it looks very good. Um, it looks like there's a fairly quick corner out there as well, which is uh, very unusual for a street circuit, but it looks like it's going to be enjoyable. You had a chance to walk it? I've been running it. <laughs> I've also been out on the mountain bike as well, which has uh, helped me out a lot, so I'm just waiting till we get out in the car now. So now let's take a look at this circuit, which is Phoenix. Better known to the residents here as Washington and Jefferson, it's a series of very tight corners surrounded by concrete barriers. John Watson will take us on a lap now. Well, we're in car with Edinson. He's just coming on to the start, finish straight, through the corner rather slowly, but now nailing the throttles, third, fourth, fifth, sixth gear. Watch just how Senna, he's got to be really very precise because Anything off the line is dusty. Back down to second gear for this right-hand corner. Now let's see a little bit of oversteer. Look, you can see a correction on the wheel. Third gear. Back down to second to go left. Again, all these minute corrections just to keep the car that very, very fine balance. Again, left in second gear. Now right. Always trying to get on the power as soon as possible, but of course, on a street track, they are generally very dirty. This is the new section of circuit. Drivers like it a lot, much better. Again, look at Senna, the tail getting away from him as he's fighting to get the power onto the ground. Coming through here in fourth gear, this is the quickest corner on the new revised Phoenix track. Back down to third here. And this is now the second fastest part of the circuit. Third, fourth, fifth and sixth gears. At the end of this straight, again, another right-hand corner, but Senna, he uses the gearbox to help slow the car down. Some drivers go straight from sixth to second, but Senna goes through the gearbox. Short shifting into third, back into second gear, left, now right, again.
then picking up the throttle, taking third gear, and then we're into this final, this very, very long and very tricky. There's no obvious apex in this corner. Rejoining the start finish line, fourth, fifth gears, crossing the line now. And that was a lap time of 1 minute 23.5, approximately 99 miles an hour. Well, the final vital qualifying session here in Phoenix, Arizona, coming up in just a few moments. We'll find out then who is on that coveted pole position. Join us in two minutes after the break. Welcome back to our coverage of the second day of the first Formula One Grand Prix of the season in Phoenix, Arizona. It is day two. Phoenix is a street circuit, and that means that what's about to happen now, that final qualifying session, is vitally important. Zed Senna is halfway through his first qualifying lap and he is quite determined to be on pole position for this Phoenix Grand Prix. He knows the value of being there. You can see from that uh, onboard camera just how bumpy and tricky this surface is. It's going to be very punishing for two hours in the race, isn't it? Yes, it's a hard race, physically a hard race, and they're anticipating temperatures into the low 80s, which is, uh, I would think, on the point of being... Well, let's say uncomfortable. Dehydration is always a big concern for a driver in a race. The race is four laps longer than... Oh, Senna must have been almost ever so close to touching the wall there. But this may well be well, a 22.831, and he snatched the pole from Alan Prost. But here is a man who perhaps we should be paying more attention to because this is Jean Alacy, the man who uncorked a barnstorming run in the dying seconds yesterday and now looks as if he might be prepared to pip Ayrton Senna again. Yes, and he had to get past one of the Tyrrells just coming into the first corner at the end of the pit straight. But let's just watch Alacy because he is a much more aggressive attacking driver than his teammate Alan Prost. I mean, last year here in the Tyrrell, he was just absolutely superb. And that performance he put in yesterday just caught everybody unawares. We didn't really see it. It just sort of suddenly flashed on the screens. John Alacy in pole position. Much busier in the cockpit than Alan Prost as well. Much younger man. A lot more enthusiasm. Hasn't had the... T oh, he's lost it. Oh, my goodness, Alacy, you were lucky there. That could have ended up in that tower wall on the exit of the corner. But he gathered it up brilliantly. He got his leg back in it again and... Uh, Oops, again, same thing, he's just overdriving the car, he's just trying too hard. How long can he go on looking for the corners where there is a bit more time and space for him? Well, I think he's just got to try and slow himself down. I mean, his heart rate must be something like about 200 beats per minute. He's pitching the car around here with abandon, almost with total disdain to the circuit. But it's still a good lap, it's still a fast lap, and this could be quick enough to put John on easy. Well, no, it's not. 23.8 was slower than he did yesterday. Here we are. Man. This is the man. This is Nige. Well, Mansell currently in 11th spot with 125.27 against the pole position time of 122.8. We know that Ricardo portrays it second on 122. This is the moment of truth for Nigel Mansell. 23.7 well, for Mansell. That's boosted him up substantially. I think that's going to have him in sixth spot. I think he's just nicked sixth spot away from Roberto Moreno. Just waiting for that to be confirmed. Yes, yes it is. Mansell now in sixth spot. But in fact, he's 0.9 of a second slower than teammate Ricardo Patrese, the number two driver in the team. But traffic on the circuit like this can make an awful lot of difference to a lap like that, though, can it not? Oh, indeed it does. And that's where, as I said earlier, the cooperation of your fellow competitors really comes into play. And... Uh, so far this weekend we've seen very good cooperation. We haven't yet seen a driver held up badly because of slower traffic. When you've done your qualifying run, of course, you tend to back off and come in rather slowly. Looking here, Alan Prost now out on his second run in his Ferrari. Well, Prost currently in third spot, as you see there. Senna Patrese, Prost, and Prost with half a second and more to find if he's going to capture pole position. Once again, he knows it's in there somewhere. Jean Lacy has managed it. He did it almost in the opening moments of this session. As we just see Nelson Piquet completing another lap. Piquet in eighth spot. But the man we're really going to be most interested to watch will be Alan Frost. But we're staying with Nelson Piquet as he completes his second time time run off Saturday afternoon. 
Well, Benetton really came alive at the end of last year. So too did Nelson Piquet. A lot of people had more or less consigned him to circulating in shirts and a place. And then halfway through the season, Nelson Piquet was back in the big way. Yes, and uh, it just goes to prove that even a driver of Piquet's experience, it's easy to pigeonhole drivers' performances. If you've done 10 or 11 years of Grand Prix racing, as Piquet has done, people assume that you lost the edge. You're not really interested in hanging it out, sticking it, you're putting your neck in on the block as they say but last year Nelson he wasn't a rejuvenated driver he just responded to having a good car a good team around him and he did a lot for the benefit team as well I think that's an awfully important point there are an awful lot of good drivers and there are more good drivers than good teams one suspects yes I think there are and, uh, you know a driver like PK with his years of experience when, when he was brought into Benetton at the end of or the beginning of 1990 a lot of people said you must be mad that, but that was lovely i mean that was a beautiful four-wheel drift 23.794 up to seventh spot now and mr pika has bumped his teammate moreno down to eight 23 point can i say 23.9794 but this is the man alan frost halfway round his qualifying run his second qualifying run of the saturday qualifying session in car now with frost coming down to this second gear right hand corner holding it in second gear round to the left short shifting into third back to second gear when i say short shifting what i mean is sometimes a driver doesn't want to use the full rev range potential it's easier to short shift in other words change it maybe a thousand revs below the potential but alan prost now again looking very very good a quick lap from prost is this good enough for pole position I think it is, 22.555, Mr. Prost on the pole. <laughs> well, we're looking now at Nigel Mansell. He's already been out once and improved dramatically. And now, Mansell looking for perhaps even more improvement, currently, I think, in six spots. Yes, but look at the traffic that Nigel's got. That's not going to help his cause a great deal. He's managed to get past quite easily. He's getting through now. The traffic is is working Mr. Alberto allowing him to get through but of course for a driver when you see traffic it tends to make you slightly more cautious and they should just are very very bullish about it and drive through it but of course you run the risk of the car that you want to be a bit aggressive with not knowing you're there and uh, not seeing you well Mansell certainly uh, famous for being bullish but I've just looked down in the pit lane and I saw the flash of red and white and a yellow helmet which means that Ayrton Senna with 15 minutes still to go is making his way onto the circuit. Well it certainly wasn't a high old silver you saw going out of the pit lane, it was Ayrton Senna. Well Mansell uh, approaching the final couple of corners on this lap and looking to improve and certainly he's making that car work as well just a little bit of slide there a nice piece of drift and that seems to be the way to approach that final corner with a nice slide on and smooth it out but that's not going to take him up near pole is it well it's got him on the second row he's fourth now he's bumped a lazy down to fifth he is joining ricardo patrese his teammate but he is still 0.4 of a second shy of patrese's time and nigel now having used a second set of tires he's got no chance to improve but so far we've got a ferrari and a mclaren and then the two williams so it's getting tight getting close well the clock up and running as Senna goes across the line at the moment Alain Prost 122.555 and Senna 122.831 he has a little over three tenths of a second to find to snatch pole uh, three hundredths of a second of it oh I'll get it right in a minute three tenths Senna I think the man more capable of that in the last class than anybody else yes well Ed Senna as I say not literally holding his breath but almost having to do that, I mean, the amount of effort, concentration, commitment that a man like Senna makes is quite remarkable. And let's just sit back and watch and enjoy the second qualifying run from Edward Senna. You see, when he goes through that corner, he doesn't pitch the car. He's not as aggressive as we've seen some of the other competitors. And that's the maturity that you're now seeing, Senna. You know, it all really began last year. These qualifying laps that he's been doing really for the last five or so years, but he used to be, I tell you, frightened. I used to say, hold my breath when I saw him. But now he's evolved that qualifying technique and style to such a level that it really does not look like he's going quickly. But take it from me, he is. And coming round that final corner, out onto the straight now, looking for maximum speed as he goes across the line. 121.434, oh, and they've that is a pole, that. That was a superb lap. I mean, it didn't look quick. 
But, I mean, he sat in the pits, Alan Prost got the pole, and what a reply is that 1.1 seconds faster than the pole lap that uh, uh, Alan Prost... Oh, that's one of the AGSs has gone off. I think that's just about coming onto the pit straight. We can't see from the commentary point, but I suspect that was Johansson, the car that had shadowed Senna around at the beginning of the lap. No damage to the driver. The car has just got itself wedged there in the gap between the concrete barriers. But going back to Senna, what a magic lap. So, John Alasian now coming around, just about to begin his first, second, I say, qualifying run. He's got a clear road ahead of him at this point. Well, he's picked There's Edmund Senna. Look, Edmund Senna's now out on the pit lane, watching that lap, just trying to see how Alasi is. They have a monitor in the pits. He'll be watching the lap. But look again, Alasi coming into that corner, leaving the brake ever so late. The car squirming under braking. A little bit of traffic didn't really hold him up, but of course he didn't have quite the part of racetrack he wanted to use. That was Eric Bernard in the Lola Ford. Jean Alesi coming into that tight left-hand second gear hip and wound the lock on. You could just see his hand coming across the top of the windscreen. Look, more traffic than that's on a very bad part of the track. He's got Emanuele Pirro in a part of the track that, oh, he hit the wall. He's had taken the left, right rear. He clobbered the wall. Now in part, Piro was in the way. Now, it wasn't Piro's fault. He hit the tower wall on the exit. That is the end of Jean Alesi's. Now, I'm not surprised. That car wasn't really in the way, but he wanted to get out of the car's way as quickly as possible. He didn't have the part of the track he wanted to use. He tried to drive through it. He clipped that tower wall that sits out just from the edge of the track. And there you see it, the right front, the right. Look, look at that. A lucky boy, I tell you six inches more that would have been right into that tire wall and a much bigger accident but you can't really blame Pirro for that because Alesi was running wide of his own accord before that yes he was but but, but Alesi was trying to do and he hit the hit actually he gave the wall a fairly good old bite you could see Alesi's head being rocked across the car Pirro was doing his best he wasn't in the way but of course Alesi was trying to take a, as much advantage as he could of that situation well, Ayrton Senna then on pole position, Alain Prost alongside him on the front row, and those two separated by almost a second again, and that's uh, the mark of Ayrton Senna. Third quickest, Ricardo Patrese, and alongside him, Nigel Mansell, 122 and 123 respectively, but it's an all-Williams second row. Next row, behind Mansell and Patrese, we see Nelson Piquet and Jean Alesi. Alesi, provisional pole overnight, had it snatched away from him several times by several people today, and then threw it away on that final corner of his flying lap. Gerhard Berger, seventh fastest, and then Roberto Moreno for the Benetton team. Emanuele Piro was fifth fastest yesterday, now sits in ninth place, and that's no bad effort from him. Tenth fastest, JJ Leto, his teammate, so they're looking very good for the race tomorrow. Stefano Modena, Martin Brundle looking good in the middle, then Mika Hakkinen for Lotus. Bertrand Gacho, a fine effort for Jordan, 14th fastest, their first Grand Prix, and that's a nice place to start in Phoenix. Pierluigi Martini, 15th quickest with the Minardi. Then Satoru Nakajima, Nicola Larini, and that's not a bad effort for the Lamborghini either. Ivan Capelli, the highest placed of the Leighton house cars. Then Eric Bernard, Thierry Bootsen for Ligier, Aguri Suzuki, 21st, 22nd. Tarquini, then Maurizio Guzelman, Mark Blundell makes it to the tail end of the grid for Brabham, so too Michele Alboreto for footwork and Gianni Morbidelli sneaks in for Minardi. At the end, the people underneath the line, Eric Comas, Alex Caffey, Stefan Johansson and sadly the Lotus of Julian Bailey, they simply don't make it to the race.